even cross the vernacular. He will. We were doing these videos and it just occurred to me that out of habit, you know, I'm using a lot of words that you may not be familiar with or you may know things by names other than the names that I'm using. So I thought we'd do a real quick video on Linux terminology or Unix terminology more properly, but it sort of bleeds over into Linux. So this is mainly for beginners. So let's let's dive in. Um, so on the screen when your computer boots up, if you've got GNOME, you'll see this, this kind of a screen. This is your um, display manager. Uh, in this case, it's GDM for the GNOME display manager if you're using KDE, a different desktop environment. Um, that would be KDM. But before you log on, the thing that logs you on is your display manager. So we got this, log in, you know, put in my password, whatever. Ta-da. Before we get there, let's show you the console. Control F1. So uh, this is the terminal and this, or a console, sometimes this is called. And uh, this shows you uh, that you know when you're running Linux, it's really it's text mode first, and then there's GUI on top of it. And so, Control F1, Control F2, Control F3, Control F4, Control F5, Control F6, F1 through F6 are sort of your text terminals. If you hit Control F7, it changes. You're back to your graphical terminal. You do Control F1, and your text terminal. This is real handy for fixing things. So I'm going to log in. Ta-da! We're logged in. LS hyphen AL. There's a list of stuff. This is a command, ls. You know, I'm at a command prompt. This works just the same as it does at a command prompt inside of, uh, you know, inside of Linux. Uh, you can manage your packages and list things and, and do all, you know, list whatever. It doesn't even matter. Most of the time with Linux, you know on Windows how you'll download a program and you'll run the installer or you'll purchase a program and it'll send you an email and you'll download a program and run an installer. Linux, by and large, not like this. There are a few exceptions. But, and I think we covered that in some of our Linux videos, but you can do a lot of things from the command prompt. So you can run the ass2 on OpenSUSE or aptitude. You may have to apt get install aptitude to manage packages. Check it out. It's a text mode thing you can use to install stuff. Amazing. Ta-da, we're back to the terminal. You can do W to show you who's logged into the system. PS to show you running processes, PSAUX to show you all of the running processes, not just your own processes. VI is an editor. It's actually Vim is what's installed by default. This is my editor. You could also use Emacs, although you'd have to install it. Or if you don't know what you're doing, you could run Nano or Pico. Oh, you don't have either of those on. I wonder what OpenSUSE uses for a simple editor. It'll. It's probably a good idea to learn VI. These are text mode commands. It's okay if you don't know what these things are. I'm just trying to use some terminology and context so that you can pick it up. So we're to terminal. Uh, the W command, it shows you a cool little thing here saying TTY. The TTY is short for terminal, basically. And so this is showing you. So console, PTS0, console, and colon zero mean different things. Colon zero means um, <laughs> from the X session. The X session is the control alt F7 graphical environment. Currently the X session, I don't really have an X session because GDM is presenting me with the login thingy. And so I'm going to use it. Now GDM is just one of many login managers. There's a ton of them beyond just GDM and KDM uh, and XWM if you're really esoteric. And you know, over the years on Linux, there've been many different versions of um, X windows that gives you this sort of graphical environment. So, I mean, there's X for 86 and X org and X 11 originally. And now we're looking at moving to Wayland, uh, away from X 11 because it's a X 11 is a protocol that goes back to the 1970s. So people on Linux like to hang on to things for a long time. X 11 is actually a protocol that turns, uh, client and server on its head. So if you are running programs from a remote server, you are the server and the client is the remote machine that's sending you programs. I can't talk and think at the same time. That's pretty much true of anyone. All right, so I'm logged in. I happen to have a web browser open. I'm just gonna go ahead and close that. Yeah, yeah, we don't care. All right, so this is your desktop environment. This particular desktop environment is GNOME. GNOME. 
Uh, KDE is a is another desktop environment. Um, GNOME is a suite of things to manage your graphical windows, basically. It's the widgets, it's the way that the windows are drawn and placed. Uh, it's the way that, uh, you know, sort of the design philosophy and the implementation of the user experience of the graphical part of your machine. Um, there are different window managers that are available other than this window manager. A window manager is defined as a program that manages the arrangement and placement of windows on your particular computer. So just as there are many different uh, window managers, there are different um, window managers that behave differently and do different things. See, so like on OS X, uh, you'll have you know three little widgets up here in the corner for manipulating the size of the window. On Windows, it'll be in this corner, you'll have close, minimize, and maximize. Well, on Linux, different window managers have completely different behaviors. There are window managers that uh, will allow you to have something that's exactly like Windows, so there are window managers that give you something exactly like OS X, and some of these different distributions of Linux will bundle things with those, those little sort of things configured. Now, GNOME breaks it down, and so GNOME gives you widgets uh, that uh, function sort of independently of one another. So if you like, you know, like Mac OS X has this little dock thing at the bottom of the screen, uh, OS X will give you that. And uh, as a separate widget, as a separate component. And so we can we just Google here. GNOME them, themselves calls call those widgets shell extensions. But as you can see, I can Google it and it gets me to where I need to be. These are things that can be installed on your GNOME desktop environment um, to give the machine more behavior. So like I've got Firefox open and you can see the Firefox is open here at the top. And so if I open another program, I'm gonna open files. Now you see it switches to files at the top and I've got a menu here, but there's no real indication that I'm running Firefox. Now if I hit Alt Tab, you know, I can see that I'm running Firefox or if I click on activities, it's gonna rearrange my windows so that I can see everything that I have open. But if you're used to, you know, um, Mac that has the spotlight thing uh, that shows the spotlight, the visual thing, not spotlight, the functionality on Mac uh, that shows you that you've got a program open at the bottom in the in a, in a little tray thing, or on Windows where you got the taskbar and it shows you the apps, then this can be a little off-putting because it's different than that. And so GNOME Shell Extension, KDE has similar shell extensions. If you're using the i3, we'll talk about the, uh, the different the window managers in just a minute. And so here's a bottom dock. And this is very similar to the OS X dock. And so you can go install this component or this shell extension, this widget uh, for GNOME. And then you'll have a, a dock at the bottom of your screen uh, where you can put applications if that's what you prefer. You Linux is all about glut of choice. You have a choice about everything. And uh, honestly, that's probably why Linux is not further along than it is, is because there is so much choice and so many people working on so many different versions of, of everything that when Linux is on the desktop, Linux will be on the desktop in infinite possible combinations. So that's a shell extension for GNOME that will allow you to enhance and change the behavior of your window manager. Another GNOME shell extension that I really like is uh, drop-down terminal. Um, there's another one called GUAKE, G-U-A-K-E. And so basically with this, you just hit tilde, and you get a terminal. And so this is really handy. Again, because Linux is really about the command line and the GUI runs on top, when things go wrong, you gotta use the command line. And so being able to quickly get to the command line really helps me in my workflow and productivity. So I've got it on most of my systems. Let's talk about window managers for a second. Another popular window manager right now is called i3. And it's like, well, why is, why is, you know, why, I don't understand. So I've got this window open. Why would, you know, it seems like it's perfectly functional. Why, why would i3 be a thing? Well, i3 automatically arranges windows. And so if you really wanted to be pedantic about this, look at how much space on my desktop is wasted. You know, I've got the cool, pretty background, but I've got all this space at the top and the sides and the bottom. And I don't know that I necessarily, it's doing me any good. And they've got two windows open and they're one on top of another. And it's like, I could drag the corners and rearrange, you know, that's probably what you're used to. But I mean, honestly, that's a waste of time. The computer could just do this for me. That's what the i3 window manager is about. So on GNOME, I have keyboard shortcuts set up. So you can just hit the windows key, window left and window right. Because I just have the windows or the the logo key or the windows key or the, the uh, meta key or whatever you want to call it, the key on your keyboard between control and alt on the left side. If you do window left and window right, you can sort of automate window placement. Well, with i3, it 
would do this for you automatically. It would just place the windows. If I open a third window, the thing that i3 does that this does not do is like if this were my active window, this list of files, and I were to open a new window, it would actually split this window in half vertically so that I have a window up here and a window down here, which is pretty neat. That's, that's what that window manager's claim to fame is. Let's take a look at your package manager. Now I've said that probably about a million times. What does that actually mean? That is the app store for your distribution. And honestly, there are a whole bunch of more experienced people in the audience that probably want to murder me for calling it an app store because an app store is like an Apple term and it's just eh, package manager, managing the packages on your Linux machine. One of the reasons Linux is so great is because you don't just randomly download programs from the internet. I mean, it's open source. It's like free sharing, free love. You know, it's the hippie, it's all the 60s. No, this is very bad. You do not want to run code on your machine that's just randomly from the internet. You want to get your code from a reputable source. Now, you know, with Windows and Mac, you, you know, you go to a search engine and you search for what you want and you find a program and you download it and you run it, that's putting a lot of trust into that program to not screw up your computer. Um, with Linux, it's a little different. Most of the time, you want your packages to come from um, a repository, which is a collection of programs, that, of one or more programs that someone has set up specifically for your distribution of Linux. And so right now, I happen to be on OpenSUSE. It's a pretty good distribution. Uh, the repositories for OpenSUSE are different, in generally, than the repositories for, say, Ubuntu, or Debian, or Red Hat, or CentOS, or Arch, or, you know, whatever. Um, and so that's something that you sort of have to get in your mind that this is how this works. Now, why is that? Well, the people that curate these software repositories generally make sure that the software is not going to screw up your machine. Now, will it still screw up your machine? Yeah, it totally could. Totally could still screw up your machine. And that's going to happen from time to time, and you're going to have to fix it. That's just part of the fun of running Linux. But generally, malware and other bad stuff does not come from these repositories because it's trusted. It's like, it's like social computing. It's like, you know, <laughs> His Highness Lord ESR hands us down the GPS daemon, and then we have the GPS daemon, and our computers may frolic and go forth and do GPS. But it's not quite directly that way. You know, ESR will do GPS, and then some very skilled developers will look at that and make sure that it's appropriate for, you know, Android or Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. And then it'll the work that's been done will be packaged up and distributed. Um, the Linux kernel and Chrome, Google Chrome, are some of the few exceptions because you can totally just download the Linux kernel from kernel.org and be running, you know, not from your distribution. If you do that, you've got to take steps to make sure that the kernel integrates with your distribution because your distribution probably has patches for the Linux kernel that um, uh, makes it run better with your particular distribution. So you don't even have to worry about that part of it. So when you go into your software manager on your computer, uh, and you go to software management, on OpenSUSE, it's gonna bring up YAST 2. On Ubuntu, it's probably gonna bring up Synaptic, the Synaptic package manager, that's the graphical one. Uh, you can also run Aptitude from the command line, as I mentioned before. I forgot that I was on OpenSUSE earlier, and I ran Aptitude, and OpenSUSE was like, ah, that's cute, yeah, I'll just give you YAST, because YAST is the name of the thing that's the package manager for OpenSUSE. And so what that means is that the people at OpenSUSE, the developers, have, uh, taken the open source software that's available on the internet that enough people are interested in. Sometimes you get a new project on GitHub and it's not there. Or sometimes you get a project like Chrome, because Chrome kind of spies on you, that really won't be supported for philosophical reasons. And sometimes you have software like an MP3 decoder. And MP3s are, are uh, maybe protected by software patents. And so sometimes that software is not included in a repository. And so there are some exceptions for popular software, but by and large, somebody's looking at the cool open source software, making sure it's not got anything wrong with it, and then sort of packaging it up for your distribution. So if you install software through your package manager, generally you're not gonna have a bad time. And so in that sense, it's a lot like the Apple App Store, where you install crap from the Apple App Store, theoretically Apple's looked at it, and a little less like that with, uh, you know, Google Play, where, you know, anybody can upload anything to Google Play and things come from Google Play. Now, here's the difference. This is a big difference. Your computer will be perfectly happy having multiple repositories. And so what does that mean? It's like, well, let's say, <laughs> let's say I was a maintainer for a game called Dwarf Fortress and that Dwarf Fortress was just ridiculous amounts of fun. Well, 
I could create a repository for Dwarf Fortress. And so my program being really popular, I could create versions of it for Ubuntu and Debian and OpenSUSE and whatever the other distributions are. And I could um, set it up so that the people that are interested in my game um, could add the repository to their computers. And so I still have the main repository that has all of the stuff in it, but then I've got this other little side repository that is, you know, from a small indie developer. And so whenever I check for new software, it'll check, you know, the big list that, you know, the, that comes with my distribution of Linux, but it'll also check the small list from, you know, the smaller guy. There's another program that you'll see in the Linux videos called Open Screen Recorder. Open Screen Recorder is a great screen capture program, at least until Open Broadcaster gets a little bit more stable. And um, Simple Screen Recorder has, reposit has instructions for adding it to Debian, Ubuntu, OpenSUSE, and so on and so forth. And so you can still install those packages through your distribution's package manager rather than just downloading programs from the internet and running them willy-nilly. And as you well know, that is how you get a virus on Windows and OS X. So with Linux, it works a little differently, and this is a better ecosystem, honestly. And there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the hood, like there's cryptographic signing and blah, blah, blah. And is it, can you still accidentally install malicious software? Oh, yeah, absolutely, you totally can. But these things, this process, this methodology helps protect you a little bit, so that's nice. Now, that's a quick and dirty introduction to um, some of the really common language that you're going to hear in the video tutorials. There's a whole bunch more, and honestly... There's even more esoteric uh, <laughs> vocabulary that you can learn that has to do with uh, things at the command line. And so things at the command line, it's like when you're searching for text, you can do, uh, you know, grep. And regular expressions are a really great way to search for things, uh, to, to search for a particular pattern in text. And people that use regular expressions with HTML are terrible because HTML is not a regular language. So... Um, <laughs> I mentioned grok, but there's also sed and awk, and uh, the things that you can do from the command line with sed and awk and uh, Unix pipes and those kinds of things. There are some really great tutorials on using bash like a pro. Now, bash is a command interpreter that is running for the terminal. There are different command interpreters, but bash is the thing that is interpreting the commands that I'm typing in here. Um, there's also C shell, CSH, uh, TSCH. I think Mac uses uh, C-Shell by default, but I wouldn't swear to that. That's probably wrong. Somebody's probably already correcting me. But uh, Bash is definitely the more, more popular command interpreter across the board um, for various Unixes and FreeBSD. So um, learning how to do scripting in Bash and things like that once you've gotten your water wings is really powerful because you can automate it. If you're coming from the Windows world, it's like PowerShell. PowerShell aspires to be this powerful. Um, and Mac OS, of course, has Unix running underneath, so there's kind of a command line there. Although Apple doesn't make it easy to do their stuff through the command line. They're like, we've got a GUI. We're done. No more. And that's Apple. So it's like, I want to edit that configuration through the command line. And they're like, well, there might be a way that you can edit a file inside the application folder. Or that could just wreck everything. It's a 50-50 shot. That's Apple. That's pretty much it. That's been a quick overview of... Uh, you know, some, some terminology that you're going to hear throw around. I'm sure that I'm going to watch this video and say, oh my God, I can't believe I didn't talk about X. But there'll probably be updates to this, to this video if I've left out anything that people really need to know about. Or if you were a Linux noob and something really tripped you up, you know, put it in there. We had a thread on the forum where I asked users. I was like, hey, I don't remember when I was a newbie because that's been too long ago. Uh, what tripped you guys up when you were newbies? And so that's where I got some of the ideas for some of the stuff to put in this. So, if you want to shape the content, come join us on the forums at techsyndicate.com, and I'll see you later.